with Dudley Leggett. We're at the Tent Embassy, and uh, this is in Canberra. And so we started talking about the Aborigines, but also about alternative living and, and yep. sustainability. So thanks, Dudley. Yep. Welcome, welcome to welcome. welcome. Yeah. So uh, I was kind of very interested in, in sustainability when you were talking about that as a chemical engineer because uh, sustainability to me is a word that we're just inventing really the meaning of it because in America sustainability started out just as recycling or energy conservation but never looking at sustainability of all life yeah so how did you you must have been uh, very a very strange man that was talking about a sustainability when nobody knew what you were talking about right just use that stuff up and throw it out <laughs> <laughs> yeah true i mean i i guess i wasn't using that specific term in the beginning but what it was i could see very clearly from traveling around the world for about four years visiting about 45 countries mostly third world countries became aware of the impact of Western culture around the planet and could see that it wasn't sustainable, it couldn't keep going, and that we had to radically change the way the Western culture uh, works because we've become so dominant that uh, it affects the whole world. So I realised the best thing for me to do was come back to my country where I had my culture, my language, and work from within Australia to do what I could to bring about a shift in our cultural thinking and then practice and decided the best way was to come back with my travelling partner and we decided we'd get married and start a family as part of a community and that that community would explore better ways of living with one another, better relationships with as a real community rather than um, the disconnected way that we now currently live in suburban life. Sometimes uh, the white mythology, you know, the way we hold the native people, and we say, well, they always respected the land, so then that was sustainability. But yeah. when you were in all these third world countries, did you see a sustainability there? Or was it just the mix between the Western, the way the Western uh, society was, you know, when you see a contrast, of course, it really comes home strong, right? If we, see, if we don't see a contrast, we can't really imagine uh, what we're seeing here. Yeah. But were, are, were third world countries sustainable? or? Well, I guess I wasn't examining them at, at that level. I was really having an experience of cultural differences by hanging out with people of a different culture and uh, experiencing what it was like to live in those places. And I think that probably the, the most significant impact that I experienced, uh, because I started off going through Asia, uh, was that having left a country that was extremely affluent in a material sense. The people were sort of uh, contemplating automation, meaning we wouldn't have to work much anymore, that everything would be done on machines, and we'd have everything we could think of. And yet, remarkably, people weren't happy and they weren't comfortable with one another. And if you on a bus or something, you smiled at someone, they go, what are you smiling about? What are you up to? Sort right. of suspicious. Suspicious, attitude. right. So suspicious. Whereas when I was traveling through these countries, everybody was so open and friendly and smiling and happy, even though they had barely two bamboo sticks to rub yeah. together, so to speak. And that struck me as what was very significant um, was that people who had very little physical, physical material goods could be a lot happier than we were. And when you saw the impact of that um, acquisitiveness that we have and that dependence and fascination with acquiring more material things was something that was clearly impacting on the rest of the world's ability to have the basic necessities. And we weren't even getting happy because of that. So there was a complete disconnect. You know what comes to me is like... Uh it's amazing how naive we were because oh, yeah. we were thinking like, oh, yeah, automation is going to make it so we work a 39-hour week and then a 30-hour week. and then, yeah. But, I mean, absolutely, it was worked the opposite. I mean, we were totally, who was going to uh, give us a 30-hour week? Well, I think that's in a whole like, other story to yeah. that question of how the economic system is manipulated and controlled by people 
who don't want people really to be free and happy. People. No, they want you to have a 60-hour week. That's right. They want you to be... And everyone family. else just to be uh, on the dole or somewhere yes. just off in well, Never Never mainly, Land. That's right. I think mainly to be to feel disempowered and to be in conflict with one another so that you won't rock the boat and change their story of acquiring yeah. power over everyone. We're in conflict with each other, right? Just yeah. keep that, keep the mix up, yeah. you know. It's a, it's a, it's a really a, it's a very deep story to this, which I've discovered over the forty years of looking into this question of why are we living the way we are. But it goes back, right back to Roman times, and how the Roman Empire is still alive and well. It's converted its um, materialistic, physical power. Uh, culture or civilization, if we could call it that, to um, ensure that people do not enter into their true power, because their true power comes not from the physical world, but from the non-sensual, the non-perceptible uh, world, and that's where people can be so enriched and so empowered to achieve um, beyond anything we can imagine today. And this has been deliberately and specifically suppressed. And I've been involved with someone who's written a book showing the steps along the way that has kept Western culture away from anything but dependence on a physical world. Once well, we we're so separate, that, you know. We're so yeah. separate. We live in single-family right. units. And, you so know. that we will require more consumption, right. which will empower the profit makers yeah. to gain more and more. But anyhow, somehow control. that's been painted as a picture of freedom, that we can all have our own little island and castle and yeah. uh, garden. And, that's the myth, and, that uh, that's what we yeah, want. Yeah, <laughs> no, but I mean, that's why you're so fascinating, a uh, community builder, and yes. even from long, long ago building exactly. a community and finding out how somebody has to develop a technology of how we can live together and like what that looks like. That's right. Well, that's it. I saw so many people happy. The main thing, they had this community and were close relationships to one another. And they needed very little in the physical world for they're happy entertaining one another and enjoying life right yeah. there in the moment. So that I mean, made I was, sense to me. I was just kind of really marveling because I was walking down some of our streets and walking in back in the Chicago area and uh, looking at the houses and stuff, and they all have front porches, yes. right? And nobody goes on the front porch not because anymore. we don't, we're not public, you know? We, right. Yeah, so it's totally, it's like a vestige of uh, something it is. far gone. Uh, yeah. that our mentality doesn't allow a front That's porch right. anymore, exactly. right? Exactly, as in an Asian village, people do live on their front porches. Yeah. In fact, they have a little bamboo porches out on the side of the road so they can chat to people as they walk yeah. past. Yeah, but I mean, even in uh, black neighborhoods, uh, uh, people are on the street in the summer, you know, mm -hmm. they're out there mm -hmm. and uh, walking. Maybe they're contentious, I don't know about that, but they're out there. But we're scared mm -hmm. to even be out there with our next door neighbor, much less uh, someone down the block. Because yeah. or... they value that interaction that humans have with one another and playing music is a big yeah. part of that entertaining one another and just enjoying yeah and we say we value our privacy but really it's so uh, unfulfilling yes you know and when we get it then we think how do we break out of this thing right we've been tricked into thinking that having things is what life's about yeah so then we go get some more things yeah. right and the better things than the guy next door yeah. so that you feel better than the guy next door oh because you God, can yeah. more so you end up in this constant struggle to achieve more acquisition than anyone else. And that I suppose there's sense. communities in the U.S., but I just have never known about them very much. You know? mm. So then it seems to me that, yeah. I don't know, tell us a little bit about how it, how it works. Or, I mean, some of these communities that you've started are well, past 20 years or even more, right? Is there a lot of yeah. flux of people coming in and out, or is there a growth to it, or is it... Yeah, well, it, um, I've been involved in helping establish a number of communities, but the main one that uh, my wife and I started back in 1972, um, it has, it, it has um, demonstrated a capacity to be fairly sustainable. It has not, uh, it's steadily grown over that time, not into the large community, but one that is very connected. Like uh, what would a community be? Would, uh, how many people would be in? Well, in, in our case, we've got about 12 households that live on one property and produce most of their own food in a biodynamic way so that it's very safe. Is that food. 50 people or how many would that be? Uh, well, probably about uh, 30 people plus kids. Plus kids, that's yeah. what I mean. Okay. So and then, then we have visitors, usually uh, regular 
visitor uh, quarters? Visitors that come either to share work in exchange for hospitality and, and accommodation. Um, but then we also have longer term young people who just want to try the lifestyle, see what it feels like and they might wow. stay a year or two or more. That's and might end up joining and might just drift on to other things or move on to other uh-huh. things. So, so many times like a uh, community needs a kind of a, a figure to uh, attach to like a spiritual community or yeah. an ashram or something like that. Yeah, but well I, our community was based on a spiritual um, basis that we adopt uh, an understanding that spiritual values are very important and common practices, meditative practices and so on uh, are shared in the community but we don't have a a leader, a spiritual leader, no one there in fact has um, a guru that they use but we share a lot of teachings. We actually have a meditation retreat centre which um, has been used over the 40 years for um, programs run by um, anybody that wants to have a teacher come and teach meditation and people come from all over the East Coast. So you bring, them, you bring them in, right? Yeah, they come up and spend a week, 10 days, two weeks doing a course and some of them come from... Just for the community or is it the course also for people outside the community? No, no, for people outside or the whole East Coast of Australia. We've had people coming from... So then you have like a big hall or something like that with with a kitchen on it. Voluntary built by input from people in the broader community, not just our community. That came and built a whole centre. Well, let's say the name of it because then maybe I want to (laughs) go. Well, they would have to uh, approach the community because it is a... You know, when there are retreats on that's promoted and advertised as a retreat and a spiritual retreat but the community itself is open to visitors coming uh, on occasions if they book in and because it's a it is a home of people and they live there and they don't want to be on show all the time of course right. but they're open to people coming and having an experience there either short term or for just for a day visit but I don't live there anymore so it's not appropriate yeah. for me to to talk tough. about what they can do. Yeah, right. Um, I left there uh, nearly 20 years ago now because I wanted to live in a community that was more interactive with the broader public and that was more focused on uh, generating knowledge for the broader community, for the country. And so that's what I set up a research institute for that purpose now so that when people come to the community, they'll already be part of a research institute operation so they'll have potential employment within the community um, so that the focus will be about learning sustainability knowledge that's your second community the second that, one that hasn't to... yet um, hit the ground in the sense because I haven't had the finance to establish it um, but I've um, developed knowledge of how to make a truly I believe a sustainable on both personal uh, social and financial terms and now we've been invited to um, share in a similar concept by a local Aboriginal leader in just uh, about two hours distance from where I live now in the inland. Byron Bay, right? Well, it's inland from Byron inland Bay. Inland from Byron Bay. Yeah. And Tell he, me a little bit about how you do it financially because uh, you have to interact with the outside for that or do you try to be totally yes. self-contained? No, no, we don't want to be isolated. That's the uh-huh. whole point is to develop knowledge that is shared with the broader public. So that would be a large part of the um, potential for income for people in the research centre that would be researching their own life experience so that we can really understand how people feel happier with a lot less, for example. Okay and um, how they get along, how they've found a way to manage their social interactions, which works for everybody. And then we invite people to come and spend time there. And that would be like a cultural tourism, you could call it. Well, what about with energy? I mean, uh, like, are you trying to be off the grid or? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Sure. So in that way, you are uh, uh, self-sufficient. Self-reliant, yeah. Because uh, we'd be, it is possible to, to, in good country, which we fortunately have chosen to live in, like good soils and water and so forth, to produce the food you need. And yeah. you can harvest all the energy you need within a local environment. And if you recycle your resources, uh, you don't have any waste 
Does leave. New South Wales have a growing season all year round? Or? Where we live, yes. Oh, that's really In Northern really New South great. Wales. In fact, most New South Wales does. Yeah. So we chose an easy option right. in order to develop a model. But then in that process, we learn how to improve the viability of other plants. And there are growing knowledge of how to improve soils, how to retain and uh, obtain water supplies. But of course, these are, you know, you take it so step by step. Is most water off the roof, like rainwater? Because I know there's well, a lot of tanks in New South Wales. Well, we are fortunate to have a very good river uh, along the pro- edge of the property. Plus, we have high water um, springs in high country so that we don't need even power to water the garden. It'll run by gravity fed sprinklers. And we also have hydro power from that creek, so hydroelectricity wow. power plus solar power. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so it, we chose country which is easy to establish, relatively easy to establish sustainability models. But then through that demonstration that it can be done somewhere, we can increase our capacity to do it in increasingly more difficult places. So that way we can spread the knowledge to, you know, to the rest of the world gradually, but starting from at least making the best use of the places we have got good facilities and good So resources. somehow your communities uh, are all well-centered because you said there's a spiritual foundation even if it's not a certain kind of a teacher teaching or practice of a certain meditation and things are uh, relied upon to have a, have a calm and, and well-centered outlook Yes, I mean, it's, it's really about holism, having a holistic understanding of what life is meant to be, and that includes spiritual, psychic, mental, um, and physical, of course. But all of those complement one another, they work together. If you have only got one leg of the stool, it falls over. And that's what's happening with our cultures. It's so dependent on the, the one physical stool that the demands on that one leg are overwhelmed because people cannot get satisfied in the emotionally if they're not in a good social environment and a good personal environment. So that can break down their emotional needs. Spiritual needs are also something in our culture very little understood, but are probably more fundamental and important to a good life. And that leads to a moral and ethical ways of living because you understand we're all connected. At a spiritual level, we are all connected. You've seen a lot of world pain. Mm-hmm. And then here we meet at the 40th anniversary of Tent Embassy. Mm-hmm. The Aboriginal, all original peoples have had a lot of world pain uh, because uh, the, new, the, the new race, the race that came in, always uh, abused and confiscated. Absolutely. Uh, what, so here we are, 40 years, and uh, much of the pain is trying to be acknowledged here. And so that acknowledgement is rebuffed uh, and deflected. So then that uh, uh, the acknowledgement of pain is repeated again and again and again. And it seems like that's the only song that we know here is that you guys abused us and it's not getting any better. And so then that's not a very good foundation to build, as we see, uh, because it's not getting any better, right? Something about that, that uh, re- recanting uh, all old uh, wounds and keeping them open. And, you know, I'm not saying that it can, I don't know. I mean, I, it's a real mystery of how that can be healed, how those wounds can be closed, right? And somehow uh, those... In, so-called power have to somehow be a part of the formula for sure, right? Mm. But uh, what can we say about the Aboriginal problem? Could, can, can steps be taken? Or, uh... Absolutely. Um, the way I've been approaching it is understanding that all humanity has a big problem right now. Some are worse off than others. Some are like the white races, if you like, the white people and the people in in, uh, in powerful countries, developed countries, as we call, have got a major advantage to push off the pain to somebody else. 
so they don't notice it so much. Yeah, I don't know if they but push it off because what they do is they numb it. Yes. They, they still they carry suppress it. it. That's true. So we're, the, the, the only way to, I believe, now uh, sort out these difficulties with indigenous peoples that have been trampled on and ignored, as in many third world countries as well, is for us, the, the advantaged people that have more power to bring about change, to understand that it's not in their benefit to continue uh, ignoring the good of the rest of the family, that we are one human family. And, that we, and so that's, a, in a sense, a spiritual perspective. But that's where true happiness and fulfillment in life comes when we recognise that truth, that we are all connected. And we, unless we're all out of pain and suffering, we're all affected by that. Of course, so, somehow that has to be uh, transformed from a good idea to an experience. Absolutely. And so then that's the real challenge. And then the spiritual teachers say they can do it, and sometimes they can and sometimes they can't. But it seems like when they can, it's uh, the very small minority that really get it. Yeah. That's why it needs to be built into, if you like, an, uh, an industry in the sense of being able to employ increasing numbers of people doing the work that needs to be done and that is to spread the understanding of how to live well. That's how I see it. To have a good life, a truly good life, and feel fulfilled, one needs to live in a proper way. That is a way that is not harming to others, essentially, and is co conscious of the effects that one is having on the rest of the world around you. So what we need is some working examples where it can be demonstrated that this is possible. And and I totally to, agree. I then, totally, yeah. totally agree. And, and then that's to what's open missing in so much, in, yeah. in the spiritual too, because so many spiritual people just say, well, they quote Einstein and say, you can't make any changes in the context from that context. And then they start saying, well, everything is going to have to dissolve in order to be reborn. And so then they just stand, in my view, they're just standing back and waiting for the crash and actually kind of smirking and saying, oh boy, it's going to be a big crash. And they're going to suffer just as much as anyone else yeah. and uh, the, with a whole breakdown of society. And then they start concentrating on all this Illuminati bull, baloney, you know, where somebody's plotting against us. And, and whether they are or not, or they think they are or, or not, I mean, still, it's just they're falling right into the trap of, uh, right. of uh, taking their attention away from uh, what is urgent. Exactly. And, uh, and, uh, I think what Einstein said is very valid, that you can't solve the problems that are created by a certain kind of thinking unless you change that kind of thinking. And so it's only from a new approach that you will find the solutions. And that's where I'm saying that we have lost our way, having lost our understanding that spirit is a major part of reality. And that that's where the solutions lie, is to understand at the less, at the non-physical, or the, therefore the metaphysical, that which is not um, perceivable by the physical senses, but is real, even perhaps more real, uh, is where the solutions lie. And, and unless humanity starts to remember, as indigenous cultures do, that life isn't just the physical, and that we are all connected and all related to the to the earth and to what is creating the earth. It's, it gets into a deep, deep understanding of reality is what we're talking about. And so unless we're prepared to go there and explore what is it that's really going on here, we stay lost. And part of the solution is to listen to indigenous races, indigenous people. We consider them uh, primitive because they don't think the way we think. And that's our, that is our problem. When we go back to finding out what we left behind when we got so clever with the physical world, manipulating the physical world, we did leave something behind, significant something. Uh, so it's in rediscovering that connection that we all have to one another and why we're here in the first place, living in this physical world, is where the solutions will come. So that's why I'm now very much more focusing on connecting with Indigenous people as we've found uh, a local elder who is, sees things very much as I do, that we need to all work together 
we need to take the best knowledge that both of us have. They welcome our knowledge, our Western whitey knowledge, and they're offering to share their spiritual and connection to earth knowledge. So we want to build a place now, which is a community that puts into practice that sharing of knowledge and builds an understanding of how we could live in a very new way. And then to invite people to come and spend time with us and be like a cultural tourism industry that could help to do the job of empowering indigenous people who are shut out of the current economy and give them the most important role, which is to help us to understand how to have a good life. Right, I, I totally agree, and I damage. totally feel it here. You know, even in a few short days, I can feel the connectedness, I can feel the peace, and I can feel the love, and yes. I can feel the beauty. I can see the beauty in all indigenous people. These people, I mean, mm. <laughs> they're all lit in a way, you know. And but then they're all troubled with kind of superficial bickering and stuff like that, and separate yes. and their own separations. That's and right. it's kept things going for many, many years, and then kind of stuck in. What really propelled propelled me here was not only to uh, learn their wisdom and knowledge, but also to um, find out. Uh, I just had this idea that uh, if who we are is really what we've been always searching for, and it's mm -hmm. right here and now. Yes. And what is the nature of this veil that seems so pervasive that it takes decades and decades and decades to get anywhere near it? And so then I had the idea that. The way peoples mistreat each other is, in order to support that and allow that, there has to be a giant numbness or a blanket of numbness. And I thought, where would the biggest numbness be? Well, that would be on the original people, you know, between the new societies and the original people would be the biggest blanket of numbness. And if somehow, uh, you know, I can't come and say I'm going to fix things, which have been tried to be fixed for hundreds of years, but I could try to help bring it out from under the rug and put it on the table and just say, can we feel this? Can we, can we be with this? Can we acknowledge us not, even not knowing what to do with it, you know? And then I thought if some of that numbness could be felt and, and therefore dissipated, that we be so much easier to just uh, do that transformation that I spoke of, the transformation of oneness is a good idea into oneness is an experience. Absolutely. And so then Absolutely. that's kind of what propelled me here. Mm -hmm. And then uh, to find you here that they are actually building a community within an indigenous population. Sometimes the indigenous seem rather closed or exclusive to us outside because they're saying that they're, they have the land, you know, and we don't have the land because we're not here for 40,000 years, right? Mm -hmm. Our progenitors. And so then, uh, then you actually found some some indigenous populations and say it's going to take all of us. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a miracle. That's right. Well, he is a visionary. This man has realized, which some of us are now realizing, is that we've got to do this together and that it isn't one race or another. We are all beneath the skin, it's only skin deep of these differences. Beneath that, we all share the same red blood, the same essential needs, and the essential connection to earth, which we've forgotten about because we think we can disconnect from nature. So finding a way to live that way together as one mob, which is the term we're using, not distinguishing in any other way than the fact that we're all humans and we're all part of the human family and journey, that in that way we can launch a new way of living. And the fact that that's come as an initiative from these people in our country that have been put down and suppressed and had their culture overridden and not been allowed to join in a real sense economically into our culture, they've been left in a sort of nowhere place and it's no wonder that they're angry many of them and lost and but to have a, a man of this knowledge because he's got the old knowledge he's done the initiations and the work with the elders and to have him step forward at this time and say we welcome you now to come to our country. I realized that when uh, the aboriginals asked for sovereignty and they asked for their land rights 
And then I realized that all white nations really are transplants from their land. No, I mean, I suppose there's some old line Italians and Germans and Spanish and so on that have been on the land for a long time, but everybody in Australia, Canada, USA, we're all transplants and we don't really have land. We don't have that way to say that uh, we're one people on one land and we don't really have the connection to land and we think that land is a commodity that you buy and sell, charge rent for and pay rent for. We don't think that we are the land. And so then when they ask for that, uh, land rights and so on, we don't even know what they're... I'm pretty sure we don't even know what they mean, and we're yeah. confused by it and scared by it. I think that's right. We think it's possession. Yeah. And that we will be dispossessed because that's our way, that's our logic. Yeah. But that's not what they're talking about. They're talking about connection to country, which is what we are. I mean, the physical body is no more than an extension of the planet. The Earth is what our bodies are, constantly interchanging the minerals, with the air uh, and the again, earth. it's a it's a great idea and it's so logical, you know. Mm. But then it's it's the know, truth. It's not experiential, though. Well, it's only Until because it we don't think about it. Until it yeah. is, right? That's the idea of having these communities, so that it is something experienceable. And it's true that a lot of like the indigenous people are wanting their land back, and they're very focused on. Um, an inward sort of thing that the date can look quite isolating for outsiders. However, there are some visionaries, and I think once that gets out there and it will have the support of the elders, I think once they realise what's um, at stake here and what the possibilities are of us getting back in connection with the country. I mean, Lewis Walker out there um, is he's just got, like... Yeah, an amazing regenerating vision to regenerate that whole landscape around there, the waterways, um, all of that. You know, we can get our own alternative power running there. We'll be able to bring people in. We'll be able to do so much um, healing. Have healing. A lot of and healing. Just yeah. What? What I guess um, the main part about the world situation at the moment is, you know, personally, I don't think. I don't have the fear of becoming extinct. However, I do see that it could get really tough. And, you know, basically, we have an opportunity now with the global political situation to make a real jump towards a much more, as my dad was saying, integrated, sustainable way of living. Um, it's just, the point is, is getting the actual on the ground model so that people can come and experience it you know, and can be reproduced. No, that's so important because somebody has to make mistakes and, and yeah. learn by their own mistakes, right? And you can't do that in a 200 million nation or a 300 no. million nation. No. You have to do that in maybe in Australia, a 22 million nation, that's or it. maybe in in Norway, a 4 million nation or yeah. somewhere. Uh, and that's where, the idea is to start spreading them all around the planet. So you have these uh, centers popping up everywhere and you can actually travel around from each one to each one. I mean, yeah. that's a great life. And see well. where they learn, right? Yeah. And in the alternative communities or something. You and know. With, with the Sustainability Research Institute, which is CSR approved and all that stuff, we can um, have a real concrete link and researching and be able to spread it, have, have the tools and abilities to spread the word. We also want to get, uh, we have plans for obviously media and stuff and having our own channels and that kind of thing going. Well, we're so lucky with YouTube and with the yeah. internet and stuff YouTube, like that, that we can YouTube we can channel. speak, you know, yeah. and almost like uh, YouTube should almost be a world right, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, totally. but if they close it down, it would really be a shock, you know. Right. I mean, and it's the economic system as well. Like there's actually a bunch of people around the area where we're from who've worked on alternative economic systems and... There's already like a local currency around that area called Let's, and um, that's uh, yeah. So they use they, you can use your own currency, and you know that is important. so important. It's important you know, to set up you know, our own because, bank I mean, systems, you know, our own. Uh, well, so a big part of our slavery is just that uh, yeah. our uh, interest system. We're <laughs> we're tied to debt. Yeah, tied to debt, which you'll never be able to repay because they want more than what they lend you, which doesn't exist because they're the ones who print the money. So what do you, you know, you steal off your neighbor and then you got to go back, you know, get more off them, which you, they're going to charge more interest. You know, it's just a silly game. So definitely getting our own uh, monetary system economics under control. And there's a lot of models around. Also, uh, participatory uh, democratic systems. 
there's been a lot of work put into that over these online. Uh, so does that now. just mean a local system, right? Well, because I mean, However, yeah, you got to start local. It has the possibility, like in the software, for it to become quite large, and um, to be able to so uh, basically everyone can have input on the decision making process that happens, rather than having a representative making the decisions for you. You know, you can yeah. you still have people in key places. But, yeah. In one way, it's clear that the older generation has done a really horrible job, you know, and we're passing you just a pile of rubble. And then you're going to have to figure it out, right? And then we can say, no, we were advanced guys, and we were thinking about it a long time ago. But really, as a whole, we're dumping a load of crap on the youth of, of the world and just saying, you know, you yeah. take it. <laughs> and we're dumping tons of debt, you know, that yeah. can never be repaid. It's not even made to be repaid. I don't think it's, it's just a, worth a even slush thinking fund. about. It's just a slush yeah. fund. Repaying it. slush fund, so, you know. I think we have to look at... Um, the, the question of you say we've made a lot of mistakes and clearly we have and we've ended up in a very serious situation globally now not just on the um, I mean curiously on the financial side which over which we had absolute control somebody did as to how the financial system worked and yet we've managed to crash that system to say nothing of the the more important the ecological systems the natural systems which all life depends upon We've ridden roughshod over that and ignored the significance of that. So on many levels, we've screwed up very badly as, as a society. Um, and yet we've had access to any amount of knowledge, you might say, but we haven't chosen to access that knowledge. And what I would say is that um, one of the things we have to look at is to what, where we need to... Um, change the way we're doing things is in the way we bring our children up, the way we're raised and the way we're so-called educated or schooled because that's where the errors begin and then you end up with uh, adults who don't know how to behave differently or do any better. So this is where the change has to happen. It has to start with the way in which we raise our children and the way in which we educate and even that is a a phony because education means to bring out from within the inner knowledge of it. all beings, have a deep inner knowledge of what's right and what's wrong and what, um, what fits with their true nature. But we're not taught that way at all. We're not, we're told in fact we know nothing and we have to go to school and have information pushed into us, which then sets up a pattern of not listening to your inner knowledge and therefore having no inner guidance. So in your communities, uh, do you do your own education? I mean, we yes. have homeschooling in the States, and it's yeah. totally legal. Yeah, yes, yeah, homeschooling yeah. is, we have homeschooling here, but it's still um, based on um, doing things that are required by the educational system. Only if you want to get financed by it, right? Well, I, well I'm not sure In order to that. do it, they, they sort of say you have to fulfill the you know, curriculum follow the curriculum however i do know people and i've done it myself a lot you just say that you're doing homeschooling you sort of get away with it without too much trouble um however what we're talking about is a much broader system i mean we already have some basic ideas about how you would run uh, better schools um my dad also helped with there was the getting a free school sort of thing that there was a good example in another country we has been running for a long time uh, run by the students and the students set up the curriculum they uh you know work out what the teachers to be paid and all this kind of stuff and have a large input into the whole thing um we know that school a little bit a, a school like a free school there's one in sudbury uh, massachusetts oh yeah, yeah. i know one. sudbury and i know one in uh, Win in uh, windsor you know, up in uh, Van north vancouver yeah and uh, they're both been going for about 40 years they're amazing they're totally well, amazing some awesome models out there that we can easily draw upon and use i mean some of the stuff that i think is core in that kind of thing is the mixing of age groups within classrooms that is core that is like, so that is core because it, cool. it because uh stratification i mean the hall of compulsory education is about de-stratifying but yet it's stratified yeah. and then when you can say there's mentoring going on and you can you can accept other ages, which is hard to do when you're you're young. You're one year or two years away is seems like eternity. But uh, and also the the learning models are isolated. So you learn maths in one area and science in another, and 
humanities, they're all isolated, they're not integrated. So I was fortunate to have the opportunity to run an international school in Asia. Wow. And I was able to have a lot of autonomy. And so I restructured the whole way that international school ran. And because we had 14 different nationalities, there was a good sampling and test to see that it could work. And in that one, we integrated the classes so the children were mixed ages and they were working on different levels, which depended on their ability, not on their class level. And that the studies were integrated according to the students' interest areas. So it was That's a... That's so much my interest. Mm. I can't tell you how much that All is right. my interest. You know, well, it was I really want to follow experience. up on so many things with you. Mm. You know, let me ask you this question, though, I wanted because I wanted to go a little bit longer on that question of uh, the land, right? Yeah. And so then, kind of the spiritualism that's come to the West through the East, I suppose, through India, uh, we're saying that we can know ourselves without our land because, I, I, I mean, I'm saying basically... My experience is that I've never been landed. I don't have any land, you know. Yeah. And I've kind of been proud of that and saying, oh, I'm for free spirit, I'm flying in the air, or whatever, you know. But I mean, uh, making excuses about it. But I mean, the Aboriginal, I can see how important it is to say we are the land. And here I, I'm saying that I thought I could know myself with no land, and just know myself as a, as a space and as awareness and as a... Uh, uh, as a medita meditative space and things like that. You yeah. know? I don't know. Yeah, well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't argue with that because the, the important thing is that we understand that we do belong to country or the earth. And no matter where you are on it, you're still on the earth and you're still feeding off the earth and you're replenishing or exchanging chemicals with the earth, etc. So we are bonded physically to the earth. We can't separate ourselves in any real way from earth, water, and air and so that we have to accept that we have a, an irrevocable connection to earth and therefore we should care for all aspects of the mother earth that we are part of and then there is the mental and the psychic and the spiritual which are not necessarily associated with this earth as except from the universe in that sense we're all connected to the universe which is a production of consciousness, you might say, or spirit. So that's when it gets really interesting because we're not just trapped on this earth, but we're also part of the universe. And that's where we're missing out, in a sense, of the full, fullness of life, um, which has been experienced by other people on this planet over eons of time. And we're missing the whole show because our Western culture dumbs us down to this separate existence where we imagine all we need is physical objects and to compete with one another to be the biggest kid on the block and it's a miserable it's a miserable, <laughs> game, right? a miserable game and it leads to all this pain and suffering for the, those that are less yeah, yeah, well off really for everybody really yeah. for everybody that's right I so thank you you know and I hope that we can follow up and maybe we can meet again in Byron and yeah, I'll sure. return and I'll be so Dudley uh, yes. thank you so much say your last name again Leggett Dudley Leggett, yeah. and, and your name, please? Sundance Leggett. Sundance Leggett. Beautiful. Thank you, Sundance. Mm -hmm. I hope to see you again. You're most welcome. It's all about sharing our knowledge. That's very important. Perfect. So thank you for your contribution. Thank you.